Hey, I'm coming to you with a video that's not exactly a tutorial. I want to run you through the work we're doing on code guidelines and uh, Razvan is doing research on how to improve the code structure in our projects and to avoid problems and errors in Godot in general. So you can go to the link in the description to the work in progress code guidelines that we're looking to apply. There's a bit of a foreword in there with a few talks, a few resources that Asvan recommended in particular that pull from um, software architecture talks and functional programming, which he has experience with, that allows you to avoid some mistakes, some problems that arise when you work only with object-oriented programming. The bulk of the issue comes with bundling methods and data together in one piece and mutating the data. The goal with these is to help everyone to write more solid code, but also to make our code consistent as uh, at GDQuest and to allow us to work together with the community. So on things like OpenRPG, but also the projects we're going to make from the Kickstarter. And they are based on the new features in Godot 3.1. So we've, we're doing our research with that. We are first defining the order in which we're going to write things in the script. So starting with the, uh, the class that the GD script file extends, then the class name, because this is key information about the class. It's a bit like the code reference, right? We want a consistent order in which we're going to write the code to make it very easy to understand how things work. So then you have the signals. And one thing we are doing in unready variables at the top of the script, we're going to store the nodes that this script accesses. So that makes it very clear which other nodes this node or script is going to rely on. One thing that was quite important while using type GD script, the type hints while using them with type inference. Let me go back up just a little bit here. So there are some cases where you have to tell the type of the node to Godot. So you, after the variable name, you type a colon followed by the type, and then you're going to, for example, get the node that you want. In this example, it's not great because the nodes have their default name, but the idea is often we change the name of these nodes. So that might be attack cooldown timer or uh, attack cooldown, and then writing the type timer add some information about that. It doesn't make the code too redundant. But then while doing that, because once you use these type hints, Godot is going to give you better auto-completion. The completion that it, if you don't add the type here and you use dynamic GD script, Godot will not necessarily know that this node is a timer and it won't give you auto-completion for the timer class. It also forces you to keep the type of the variable consistent, especially with things like a variable like animation length. We use type inference here. So you just type the colon as Godot is going to take care of picking the type for you. So it's going to be a floating point value. So it's just one extra character to write or two with the space. You not only get auto completion, but also much better errors as you type your GD script in the editor, Godot will say, here, you're trying to change the type or things like these, you're not using the right method. So it's going to warn you that your code is not going to work or that you might create bugs. And when we are working together on free software, this helps a lot because you have people who might just jump on the project. They don't look at the entire code base. They look at one script or something like that. They start to modify things. With these type hints, it prevents lots of errors. They will get many more potential warnings. And in the future, as there are improvements planned for the GDScript compiler, these type hints should bring performance improvements as well. So it's a nice bonus to have here, even though we're doing it for the code's readability. Another example is when you are using methods and you give a type to the methods arguments. If someone calls one of these methods something like, yeah, quest system dot start, and then you have to give it a quest and someone tries to pass a dictionary in there. So another type could will say, no, no, you can't do that. It will highlight the line in red in the GD script file. And so you can save some headaches using these type hints. There's explanations on every decision that we make, hopefully, or we, we can provide them if that's not the case. We're really thinking hard about these things to help write code that's as consistent and as possible and that is still readable. 
For example, you don't want to work with the null type. Instead, you really want to work with type that the method is supposed to return, so an object or something like that. So you want to be careful about these things. And there's also a section about naming your variables and a few conventions that we use here to make the code more readable because it takes a bit of training to name variables in a way that's not only easy to understand for you as you type it, but easy to understand for you in the future and other people you are working with. And I can tell you working on open source projects, lots of people struggle with that. And then we're working on a system architecture and Razvan is doing experiments with that in particular. He's got experience with functional programming where you try to separate the data and the functionality and you make sure that these are decoupled because one of the biggest sources of bugs in object-oriented programming is when you have functions that modify the state of the object, so that modify their properties. You change the character's position, you do things like these. With, with traditional object-oriented programming, it's not uncommon to have a long script and you change the same variable here, 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 and maybe in another script there. And so if you try to change how your GD script code works, it might break in four different places. With the idea of functional programming, you keep the parts where you make the mutations in one place as much as possible. And then the other functions, they just take inputs, return outputs. They don't do anything else. All the places that are most likely to generate bugs and to break are all in one place together. So the, the code is readable because you've created these functions that have descriptive names and you know which calculations they make from the name. In practice, it helps to avoid bugs. So you know our open source RPG, open RPG, and uh, Razvan has been doing some experiments to remake some of the systems to try to simplify the code or make the hierarchy a bit more logical and avoid spaghetti code and bugs. So he's still doing experiments with that, pulling from the entity component system, not like creating an entity component system, but pulling some ideas from it and trying to make them work with Godot. So what makes ECS good, um, separating the data and again, processing on that data. One example of uh, the work he's been doing is on the board here. The, the board is really the grid that the characters move onto and that you place actors onto in the RPG. And then you have the pathfinder in there, which is a node that's going to find a path between two points, so where the character is and when you click on the map. And then you have the map itself, which is the tile map. Right now, the hierarchy, for example, that he's picked for that makes it so each of these three elements has one main responsibility. It's hard to make uh, each class have only one responsibility, although, although that's a core principle of object-oriented programming. Each node should do one thing and do it well. A camera shouldn't, for example, try to do cinematics or trigger events in the game, just control the view. That's the kind of idea. And so the map, for example, only has the responsibility of providing the pathfinder, the A-star pathfinding algorithm, with the data it needs from the map to work. It has a get points method, get obstacles, and get tiles as a dictionary. It's going to return the tiles, the information about the tiles that are in the map. And uh, for example, the get points method uh, returns all the points that A-star needs to connect to know exactly where the character can move, how many cells are there on the map. Then you take the pathfinder and the pathfinder is going to ask these points to the map. And it has a few more methods here. It might look a bit complicated, but the idea is that you need to set up this A star grid, like you need to create a graph of points. And A star in Godot works in 3D by default. Uh, Razvan has been creating a few methods, 2Vector2, two 2Vector3, two to make sure that Pathfinder converts all the data into 2D, because this is a 2D game, so that then when you go to the board, which is going to ask for paths, uh, the paths are in 2D. They are in only in 2D space, and you don't have to bother about the 3D complexity or modifying the data to use it, because by default, if you look at 
uh, a star and get point path or that was something like that yeah get point path it returns a pull vector 3 array so an array of 3d coordinates anyway while doing work on that i'm going to leave you with the links and i invite you to check out our code guidelines if you want to talk about them use the comments join us on discord all the links are in the description and we're doing that work during the kickstarter as pre-production for the project seems like we're going to get funded so uh thank you very much for that thank you very much for your time feedback is welcome as usual if there are some things that you struggle to understand in the guide or you think we should add another section or something like that please tell us the idea is that if people are interested we can contribute that back to the offshore godot documentation that's it thank you kindly for watching be creative have fun and let's see one another in the next one bye bye